we will not see the success that we need in order for us to continue our life here in what is now Saskatchewan. Tonight, the Cowess's First Nation in Saskatchewan receives thousands of acres of land back. We know that cities are judged uh, by downtowns, and we know that downtown housing is absolutely critical to a safer, more vibrant Winnipeg. More funding to revitalize and add housing to Winnipeg's downtown. So I pretty much have been like around music my entire life. Grew up kind of watching my family perform and sing and play instruments and stuff. And a country legend's granddaughter is looking to make a name for herself. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. Unsafe drinking water continues to plague communities in Nunavut. NDP MP Peter Julian asked the Liberals why during question period today. Here's that exchange. Water is life and access to safe drinking water is a human right. But in Nunavut, only 8 out of 25 water treatment facilities pass their health and safety tests. The result is a very real possibility of unsafe drinking water for the people of Nunavut. Liberals have neglected to provide healthy drinking water for Indigenous communities. Will the Liberals act urgently to provide the funding that ensures Nunavut communities have clean, safe drinking water now? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we know that it's unacceptable to have any communities without access to clean drinking water in this country. Uh, we've worked really hard at the first time in, in our government's history, actually, to put forward record investments around this. Right now, there are existing 28 long-term drinking water advisories, and we have a project underway for every single one of them. We've already lifted 144 long-term drinking water advisories since 2015. 96% of First Nations still have uh, access to their clean water, and we're going to make sure that it stays that way. Particularly the further north, where there's ongoing challenges that are specific to their region, we're going to make sure to work with them for an Indigenous-led, Inuit-led uh, solution to this problem. Thank you. Still with question period, NDP MP Charlie Angus grilled the Liberal government about funding a proper hospital in James Bay. The Winnebago Area Health Authority has stated there has been no money announced by Ottawa for its new hospital. Meshkigawa Cree region is ground zero for underfunded and systemically racist federal health policy. Yet through it all, the Winnebago Health Authority has worked hard to establish quality health care and proper facilities. And yet at the 11th hour, the Minister of Indigenous Services walked away on her commitment to build a proper hospital. On Monday, national, regional, provincial leaders on health and Indigenous rights will be coming to Ottawa to hold this government to account. They want to know, why did the Minister break her word to the people of James Bay. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Indigenous Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And for years, we've been working with Waha and the communities it serves to shape the future of health care delivery. Con conversations are ongoing with all partners as every level of government has a role to play to ensure health care for remote communities. From Toronto to Kenora to Mus Musone, everyone deserves quality health care regardless of who or where they are. We will keep worth working with Ontario and with Waha to find a path forward. Thank you. To southeast Saskatchewan now, where the Cowessis First Nation has recently received thousands of acres of land back through a recent transfer. The government of Saskatchewan says 3,800 acres of Crown Mineral Rights land will be transferred to Cowessis First Nation under the First Nations Treaty Land Entitlement Settlement Agreement. Cowessis Chief Erica Bowden says the additions to reserve or ATR, is located in various areas surrounding Cowessis, and the land will most likely be used for more farming. Chief Bowden says all levels of government have a responsibility and obligation in ensuring First Nations prosper as well through the treaty that was signed between First Nations, the Crown and the Canadian government 150 years ago. Without it, us, the original peoples, the Queen, or pardon me, the King now, as well as the provincial government, um, without all of us working together under that treaty co covenant, we will not see the success that we need in order for us to continue our life here in what is now Saskatchewan. To Winnipeg now, where the federal government unveiled $31 million in funding to the Southern Chiefs organization to help revitalize downtown Winnipeg. 
The funding will help the SCO develop the Weiwei Na Bay Ging King Nigong project in the former Hudson's Bay Company building. Sierra Bettens has that story. All people deserve a place to call home. Right here in this very building, we will witness the creation of 350 much needed units for housing of First Nations families, post-secondary students, elders and our veterans. In a few years, this former Hudson's Bay Company building is slated to reopen with affordable housing units, a child care centre and even a museum. Today, the federal government dedicated $31 million in funding to the Southern Chiefs organization to support the Weiweina Bay Gakanagan redevelopment project. We know that cities are judged uh, by downtowns and we know that downtown housing is absolutely critical to a safer, more vibrant Winnipeg. Uh, we also know that Winnipeg is Canada's most vital city uh, when we talk about reconciliation. $25 million of funding comes from Infrastructure Canada to support building repairs and upgrades. The remaining $6 million from Prairies Can will support the creation of Mickinac Connect, a First Nations workforce recruitment app. The team hopes to hire over 400 people to work on the redevelopment project through the app. Manitoba Minister of Housing, Addiction and Homelessness, Bernadette Smith, said the province will dedicate up to $10 million in funding for the project, in addition to their $25 million Bay Building Fund. This continuum of care that we've been talking about, getting people from encampments into homes, into employments, and into even imagining owning their own home. This is what I see this place being. SEO Grand Chief Jerry Daniels said the project is developing more housing that will total 358 units. That's up from the estimated 200 units previously planned. The project will also develop services like childcare and subsidized food costs. There's more, more units here than uh, had initially been here two years ago. And so we, we added an entire floor of units here, so there's going to be more housing here uh, than there was initially. While the timeline isn't set in stone, Grand Chief Daniels said they hope to host a soft opening on the building's 100th birthday in 2026. Sierra Bettens, APTN National News, Winnipeg. The trial of an admitted serial killer in Winnipeg is on a short hiatus after the Crown rested its case this week. Coming up after the break, we'll speak with the two APTN news reporters who have been sitting in on court day in and day out. Stick around. Welcome back. The Crown wrapped up its case this week against an admitted serial killer in Winnipeg. Lawyers for Jeremy Skibitsky say he is not criminally responsible due to a mental illness. The trial is now on hiatus until June 3rd. For more, we're joined by our reporters T.R. Wheatley and Kathleen Martins, who have been sitting in the courtroom every day. TR and Kathleen and for all the work you've been doing on this. Uh, TR, we'll start with you. You worked with the MMIWG inquiry. Are you finding similarities inside the courtroom as to what you heard when, back when you were traveling the country with the inquiry? Uh, yeah, Dennis. In a way, it kind of feels like five years haven't even passed. Um, you know, that uh, the report was delivered in 2019, and right in the intro, it talked about how Indigenous women, girls, two-spirit, were being forced to confront violence on a daily basis uh, while perpetrators act with impunity. And I mean, this is playing out right now in the courtroom. I mean, right from day one, we heard the interrogation tape, um, you know, from a visibly white male who says he had targeted um, homeless shelters for the Indigenous women. Um, you know, at one point we heard from a worker that also worked in that shelter who told us that the, ma the man that's in the trial now, um, he didn't even need to be there. He had his own place and that he just went there to stalk his victims. So, you know, putting that into context from, you know, this trial and then working at the inquiry, um, you know, you're seeing similarities definitely. So when I actually worked at the inquiry, I had a twofold kind of job. I worked with the commissioners, um, but I also did statement gathering. 
and you know most of the family members and survivors of violence that I had the chance to get, gather their statements for you know they all you know they all had their own stories of course but there were similarities right in that storyline you know they were pretty similar there they each told me that society viewed them as less than worthy um, and that perpetrators always felt safe enough to continue to do what they were doing to them. So, um, you know, putting that into context, uh, a lot of the calls to justice, you know, focused on the lack, the lack of basic human needs. Um, and again, that's playing out in this very trial, you know. Um, you know, I had the chance to check in with two of the commissioners. Um, you know, I, I continue to keep, you know, keep in touch with them after all that hard work that they did. Um, you know, and, and they say the same thing that, you know, the very things that they talked about five years ago, it's still playing out. Um, one thing, though, that I've noticed uh, in court is the families, they're getting some supports. Um, you know, we've reported on that. They've been getting some money from the federal government and uh, the province, um, you know, to help with their mental health. So I guess in that small way, one of those um, calls to justice were answered, at least here in Manitoba. Uh, Kathleen, you know, uh, you've covered numerous trials over the years. Uh, can you give us a sense on how this one might be different uh, from previous ones? Yeah, pretty much in every way. You know, I've, I've, I've never covered one where the accused confessed, but not really. You know, the, Mr. Skavicki has said that he did it, he committed the murders, but he should be found not criminally responsible due to a mental disorder. So then we're still having the trial, the Crown is still trying to prove that he is criminally responsible and, and wasn't mentally ill at the time. And so it's that is very different where we can refer to him in our uh, media coverage as the killer or the murderer or the self-confessed killer um, and yet we still have to observe all the legal and journalistic principles when it comes to covering court yeah tr as a, a Cree woman and journalist what's it like being in the courtroom with the families hearing details that i'm sure you know we haven't even reported on yeah, Dennis, um, the easiest way to say it, it's this um, struggle of trying to walk this imaginary line, uh, this imaginary line, you know. Um, you know, part of that as media, myself, you know, in those calls to justice from the National Inquiry were calls to us, you know, and, and, and it was, you know, challenging us to stop victimizing these Indigenous women who have already been victimized. So, you know, I think of those families that are in that courtroom, but I also think about the families across the country and my own family as well, you know, because we've also experienced this type of violence, you know, and then it's trying to find that balancing act. What do we show? And I'll give you an example of that. Um, you know, in court, we've seen the interrogation video of Mr. Skibitsky himself, um, you know, admitting to this. And, you know, I've, I've struggled with showing it because there's that public right to know, but it's also you know, what, you know, in my coverage, at least anyway, and APTN has been supportive of me of this. I've never given him sound bites, you know, where you actually hear you speak from him. We've shown his video, but, you know, I'm trying to be more trauma-informed to these families that way. So, you know, it's balancing that, um, you know. And then even having that video, I would much rather have video or photos of, you know, these women that we've lost. But again, there's that breakdown and, you know, a lot of these families don't trust us with those intimate, you know, mm -hmm. photos of their beautiful loved ones and whatever else. So, you know, sometimes we don't even have those, um, you know. So again, it's that constant struggle. Myself is an Indigenous woman who's experienced violence, you know. It's not about me, but at the same time, this, this whole thing is showing that, that um, the issue, the stronger issue about violence against Indigenous women and girls, um, you know. And then it's also trying to find that safe balance, you know. Um, you know, I've chosen not to be specific in terms of certain body parts. Um, although in two different reports I I did, I was specific, but I felt like, you know, that was important to know. Like, you know, you, you hear, we heard about this um, person, this garbage picker who, you know, was just walking by and he opened up the garbage and there was a female, you know, a female body part. And it's just, you know, it's finding that balance. Um, as well in the courtroom, uh, Mr. Skibitsky walks into the courtroom and out of the courtroom alongside where we as journalists are sitting. 
And all of us just, just have to decide, do we want to look at him? Do we want to try to meet his eye? And I've spoken to TR about that because she's the most visibly indigenous journalist in the group. And what has that been like? Has she looked at him? And she can tell you what she did. See, I, she looked at him right in the eye and held his gaze. And she told me later, as an indigenous woman, how important that was for her, something the victims aren't around to do anymore. And she felt that she needed to do that, and she did. Well, again, Kathleen TR, thanks to you both for speaking with us about this trial and for all the work you've been doing here over the coming er, last few weeks and, and the weeks to come when things resume on June 3rd. Thanks again. You're welcome, Dennis. Thanks. And sports are available 24-7 for anyone affected by these stories through the MMIWG2S support line. That number is 1-844-413-6649. Time for one last quick break. Still to come, we sit down with Katie St. Germain to hear about her musical roots and her new album. I've got three boys at home that are kind of watching me and I'm constantly telling them like, you know, you can do anything you put your mind to and yet I wasn't. So they definitely were my inspiration to kind of try writing a song. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. It was a f stormy few days in Ottawa this week with days spent under severe weather watches. Carrie Slack shared this photo of storm clouds rolling in. Looks almost like a hurricane approaching. Thanks for sharing that, Carrie. Stay safe. Send your photos to share at aptn.ca and you could be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, 22 for Halifax and Fredericton. Eight in Kujuac, snow and a high of three for Nain. 22 in showers in Montreal, 17 with rain in Val d'Or. 15 with showers in Sault Ste. Marie, 16 in rain in North Bay. 16 with showers in Thunder Bay, 10 and rain in Sioux Lookout. 10 with showers in God's Lake, Norway House and the Paw. Rain and eight in Winnipeg, chance of snow and eight in Dauphin, 17 in Regina, 15 in Saskatoon, 17 in Uranium City, cloudy and 11 for La Ronge. In Northern Alberta, 18 for Fort Chippewan and Fort McMurray. Rain and 16 in Edmonton, 18 for Lethbridge. Showers and 15 in Vancouver, rain and 17 for Kamloops. 16 with showers in Prince George, 14 in Smithers. Zero with snow in Old Crow, 14 in Whitehorse. 17 in Yellowknife, showers in 12 for Norman Wells. Zero and flurries in Saks Harbor, eight in Politak. Seven in Chesterfield, three for Arviet and Baker Lake. Minus four in Resolute, zero in Joe Haven. The granddaughter of Métis country music royalty, Ray St. Germain, recently launched a solo career. Today, singer-songwriter Katie St. Germain released her debut EP, Cleaning House or Trying. She sat down with APTN Sierra Bettens in her studio to chat about her musical roots. I wake up in the morning from watching her grandfather Ray perform on sold-out stages to scoring a Manitoba Country Music Award, music runs in Katie St. Germain's blood. After playing in cover bands in bars across North America, the Red River Métis artist is charting a new path as a solo musician. On Friday, St. Germain will release her debut EP titled Cleaning House or Trying. Ahead of the release, we sat down with her in her studio to talk about what's on the horizon. Thanks so much for joining us, Katie. Thanks for having yeah. me. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe kind of just start at the beginning. Um, if you could just tell me a bit about your musical roots. Mm -hmm. So I've pretty much have been like around music my entire life. Grew up kind of watching my family perform and sing and play instruments and stuff. So pretty much from like, I mean, as long as I can remember, I've been 
on my fireplace mantle, like belting out songs and singing, pretending I was on a stage. So yeah. Yeah, and um, I know you're kind of just starting to embark on a solo career, but I was kind of curious about what inspired that turn. I definitely knew that I wanted to try my hand at writing my own songs and stuff. I've got three boys at home that are kind of watching me, and I'm constantly telling them, like, you know, you can do anything you put your mind to, and yet I wasn't. So they definitely were my inspiration to kind of try writing a song. And what was it like, you know, growing up in a very musical family? You know, your grandfather is Ray St. Germain. Mm -hmm. um, you have a lot of singers and musicians in your family. Yeah. Um, how did that sort of shape you as a musician? I mean, I feel like very much so it shaped me into who I am. Um, and I think another part of it too is like just always growing up around so much music and so much like talent was very intimidating for a long time. Like I felt like I was definitely in the shadow a little bit and had to come into my own as a performer and like as a singer and um, so I, I learned a lot but it definitely took me a, a while to gain the confidence to kind of branch out on my own. I mean I, I'm gonna be 35 this year so um, it took me a while to, to branch out on my own and start doing this solo thing. Yeah and I was wondering if you kind of moved to your debut EP. Um, can you talk a bit about some of the themes and stories that you know are kind of can be found in the songs in the EP. So High Forever is like a really great love song, super fun and upbeat. And uh, Cleaning House, which is coming out on Friday with the EP, is kind of the next one. It's really just cheeky and attitude-y and I love that. Um, and uh, and then of course the couple that I wrote called, one's called Last Breath, which I absolutely love. And it's basically just about music, how music has always just been such a huge part of me. So. Um, yeah, and then I just can't imagine doing anything else. Like, yeah, and back to this kind of question of influences, um, I was curious as to what your Red River, Red River Métis heritage plays in your music. I grew up listening to my grandpa on NCI, you know, they'd have the Métis hour times too, so um, I really tend to gravitate to towards like fiddle and all of that in my music, so I think that plays a huge part, especially in some of the newer stuff that you guys are going to hear. Yeah, and just, you know, being a mother of three, how do you sort of balance, you know, being a mom and, uh, you know, pursuing music as a career? I feel like we have a lot of family help, lots of babysitters we trust, and the boys are like, the boys are right in there too, like they know that I have to, if I have to go do a show, a lot of them are family friendly so they can come, which is really cool and special. They get to kind of watch me perform, which also brings back like a lot of flashbacks of when I was a kid, like <laughs> watching my mom and my grandpa perform. So yeah, very cool. St. Germain's debut EP, Cleaning House of Trying, will be available to stream on all major platforms this Friday. Sierra Button's EPTN National News, Winnipeg. Good stuff. My favorite track on the album so far, you'd hear in there, is The Day Gets Too Long. It's got an Ashley McBride vibe. And I am a big fan of cheeky, attitude-y tunes. That's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Friday. For news anytime, you can visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward, Marcy McGwitch. Thanks for tuning in. We leave you with some of my favorite viz from the week. Wild sheep on a mountain. Have a good night.